Good morning, and uh, thanks to Sami for <laughs> inviting me to this exciting event. We have seen uh, uh, very, very uh, impressive uh, uh, results, uh, recent results from uh, robotics research, and we know very well that uh, these progresses have been uh, steady and uh, increasing in uh, relatively, uh, I mean, a uh, small number of, of, of years. Uh, robotics is a young discipline, but robotics and AI progressed very, very fast and enormously recently. And we know that uh, in many cases it is already a business. There is a very important revenue related to this, especially in AI. And there are, um, sorry, and there are also uh, very good outlooks for that. Uh, especially for um, a big market for service robots that is uh, uh, forecasted to, to happen to materialize very soon. Uh, we also know that uh, Europe uh, is in a very good position in robotics research. Uh, this is in terms of publication. If we sum up all the European countries, we have a very uh, good number, basically higher than other countries. But this is also true for the industry in Europe, so for producers, manufacturers of robots, um, even in um, uh, in startups, that is probably less uh, uh, intuitive to think. We always think that the startups are very, very uh, good in the uh, US, but actually, if we again sum up all the European countries, we have a number that can compare. Uh, so all this motivated uh, the decision for submitting a proposal to the European Commission about uh, uh, a so-called flagship project, FAT flagship project about robotics. So this uh, uh, robotics flagship proposal, uh, you probably are aware, familiar with the uh, FAT flagship projects. They are a bit different because they have a longer vision, longer term vision, and uh, 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 also a um, larger scale of investment, of course. Uh, so the vision is uh, 10 years, and uh, um, more precisely what is open and just closed is uh, a call for preparatory action. So not for a flagship itself, but for preparatory action of an year where the uh, final proposal for the flagship can be defined. And uh, the call was open on three uh, different lines areas, and you see that one of them includes robotics and artificial intelligence, so of course we are responding to this one. It was in two, and we will have at least one, at most two, um, preparatory actions funded on each line. Uh, it was on two stages, so we submitted a, a first uh, a part of the proposal last February, and uh, we were invited to submit the full proposal last September, what, uh, which we did, actually. So we are waiting for the evaluation by the European Commission. What is uh, inside this proposal? Uh, in terms of science and technology, the contents uh, um, are very much in line what, with what we have seen today and with what uh, is seen as the main challenges uh, for robotics progress. And I have just stolen this picture from a recent paper published in Science Robotics because it is very much in line with our scientific contents and it's a good way to, to show them. We have seen uh, Bioinspired Robotics this morning already, uh, so it's somehow le taking lessons from nature. It's not just coping uh, living beings. Uh, but trying to extract principle. Principle that can make our robots work nicely in environments like this one. So environments where still uh, living beings are, are somehow better than human beings. But what are the lessons we want to take from, uh, from uh, nature? Um, Usually we think that our robots uh, are a bit too complex to work smoothly and nicely in these unstructured environments. But maybe if you talk to neuroscientists, to biologists, maybe they say they are too simple. So they are not complex enough. Uh, if you look at any animal in terms of receptors, muscles, and neurons, uh, they are far more complex than our robots. So what I think is the lesson we should take from nature are those simplifying principles that make a complex system work nicely in a complex environment. So we shouldn't try to simplify the environments of our robots or to simplify the system itself, the robots itself, but we should try to find these principles. And what we want to simplify actually is uh, the behavior of the robot, the control of the robot. 
not the system. And uh, I now give you an example from an animal, uh, because Antonio mentioned this. <laughs> and uh, um, my, I'm sorry, uh, before giving the example, I give you also this scheme to show you where this simplification can be in the control of uh, a robot behavior. Uh, we have seen uh, also this morning several times that uh, um, the behavior emerges a lot from the interaction with the environment, which was somehow discarded in, in robotics for for some years, uh, and we can simplify, so this is simplification mechanism, simplify some robot tasks if we take this into account, if we take into account the part of computation that can be done by the physical body. But to do, the, to do so, we have to change a bit the way we build robots, uh, and we have to take into account this mechanical feedback, which is actually the key to simplify control. And so we have to use compliance. We have seen a beautiful example, and uh, um, it was also mentioned already that the animal world is in fact soft. There are some special animals that are completely <coughs> soft, but there are a few. Also, all the other animals that have skeletons or exoskeletons, they have soft tissues. And the human body, for example, has only 11% uh, of body mass related to the skeleton, to the rigid part. So, i give you an example to show you some of these simplifying principles in a very special animal uh, for me, which is the octopus. Uh, and you see this movement, it's very well studied in biology, very well characterized, that there are many muscles involved, many neurons involved in this uh, movement. Uh, the, com the, the system is complex, the environment is complex, there is a lot of fluid dynamics to take into account if you want to have a, a, an efficient movement. Uh, but uh, uh, then we, almost by chance, we saw that the behavior of uh, a completely passive cone of silicon, like this one, in the same environment with just an acceleration at the base, uh, produced a movement which was very similar. So, I mean, we said maybe the octopus is not really controlling all those muscles uh, with all those neurons. But a lot of the shape of the movement is given by the interaction with water. So we went uh, into um, the, uh, a bit more in detail into the uh, biology and we discovered that in fact the uh, brain of the animal only um, uses three parameters to control this movement. So this is what I mean when I say simplifying principle, only three control parameters to control many degrees of freedom very many in this case. And we tried to copy some of these principles in the way the octopus arm, uh, the, the, the muscles in the octopus arm are arranged uh, and uh, with, with several technologies, but I don't go into the details of this. And uh, uh, again, we discovered something interesting, also by chance, uh, uh, in the animal, it was uh, um, found that the velocity profile of uh, this bending wave is constant invariant respect to the uh, to the um, target to the position of the target and we discovered this also in our um, robots this is a simulated one but we also tested it in several prototypes and uh, and then we we made some uh, uh, experiments changing some of the conditions and what we found is that uh, uh, we obtained the same invariant velocity profile when we have basically the same environmental properties and some morphological properties uh, like the passive distal part. So again, uh, some uh, uh, suggestions that are the morphological and environmental properties that uh, uh, make the movement efficient. Uh, and of course, all this uh, brought us to change the, uh, the, the way robots are fabricated and the materials used. So we had to use, uh, uh, let's say, soft material. Soft is not a good definition. It's not uh, uh, very formal, but it's, uh, I think, clear and intuitive enough. Um, <coughs> And what uh, uh, we, we have this, with this uh, uh, use of soft uh, uh, materials is that we have a big shift in, in robotics from this rigid link approach to the uh, soft continuum robots. Uh, and uh, of course, with a lot of fundamental research on the, on the technologies and several new technologies developed for that. But what is uh, uh, important is that the use of soft materials also opens to uh, abilities that were not possible before. So now we can think of robots that can deform, that can squeeze, that can resist impacts, that can uh, self-heal depending on the materials used or even uh, grow. 
All this in view of the uh, many applications that seems uh, to appear soon. Mm, so all, all this uh, uh, forecast, a uh, huge market for service robots need um, this kind of new abilities uh, and new technologies. Uh, and of course, the power and energy is also uh, a big issue here. Uh, so we are thinking in our proposal of robots that cannot uh, uh, just be powered externally but should have some mechanism to find their energy in the world. So in general we are thinking of robots that are better integrated in the environment. Today technology is something completely uh, separated from the environment, something that uh, costs energy to be produced, costs energy to work and then became, become uh, waste. So we are thinking of robots robots that can find their energy, adapt to the environment, and at the end of their life somehow integrate back in the environment like biodegrading, because we cannot think of uh, a starting new huge market of robots that uh, uh, become something like this. Uh, this happened with, uh, with the cell phones, with the computers, with, with many things. So of course, uh, this is uh, uh, growing, it is called e-waste. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, it's growing, it's becoming a big problem for the planet. Uh, another uh, important aspect of the scientific and technological content uh, of the proposal is AI, AI for robotics. So as roboticists, we say AI for robotics because uh, artificial intelligence is given a brain to our robots, giving intelligence to our robots to make them autonomous, to make them uh, able to uh, have a, 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 an effective behavior in, in the real world. Uh, but we can also see it uh, in the reverse way. So uh, robots are a body for the artificial brains, for the artificial intelligence. So they can become even a way to bring the, 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 the results of the artificial intelligence out of computers, out of the uh, computer screen, of the smartphone screen, and do some physical work in the physical world. So there is, uh, uh, of course, a mutual benefit in these two ways. And uh, uh, maybe um, together, if we consider this mutual benefit, we can say the, that uh, Europe can become leaders in this uh, uh, robotics AI, leveraging on the uh, competitiveness in robotics. So a uh, very positive scenario from our point of view, huge market starting, a lot of uh, progress uh, on the technologies, new approaches, uh, should be, we should all be happy. But when I present this, uh, I usually receive feedback like this one. And I, I am sure that other roboticists share the same feeling. So the, the robotics raises a lot of concerns about uh, job, the job uh, market. So, um, where are these robots? Uh, let's try to see them. Of course, they are in factories, but they have, and, and they're fantastic here. Uh, so they are very much part of our lives already because they produce all the products that we use. And this is just a, a fantastic technology, very reliable, uh, very fact, something we cannot do without today. And since this happened a few years ago, we have some statistics, we can see what happened to jobs. And actually, it's demonstrated that in the companies investing in robotics, the number of employees in general increases. And the, 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 this is also uh, a bit uh, impressive for me. Uh, the number of, uh, I already give you the, the, I wanted to ask you what you think is the density of robot. In the, in the country with the higher, Den the highest density, which is South Korea. In fact, the number of robots with respect to human work is only 5%. So it's not, not really replacing the, the human labor. And uh, um, the World Economic Forum made an analysis of the future of jobs because there are so many transformations today. And they are related to many, many factors. There are many drivers. And if you look at their report, uh, robotics and the, and the AI are really minor uh, drivers in this sense. Uh, what about service robotics? Uh, they are a little less on the market at this moment. Uh, there are some, of course, they are well accepted in dangerous tasks. 
Uh, they are also well accepted in, I mean, just annoying uh, tasks like domestic chores, but still there are many places where we cannot uh, have commercial uh, real uh, service robot helping us. So where are robots in scenarios like this, or like this one, or, or like this one? I think there are many uh, tasks and many jobs where robots could really help and could really help uh, um, increasing the quality of, of, of job, of work for human beings. But of course, the answer to, to, to the question if robots will ever steal jobs uh, cannot be uh, just answered with the statistics or by saying, okay, people will, uh, will no more do this kind of undecent jobs, but they will build robots. That can, cannot be the only answer. And uh, we think that uh, uh, an initiative like a FAT flagship in robotics should uh, just investigate uh, completely different views of the economic model. So uh, this is very ambitious, but we think that we should try to investigate uh, uh, how, what the human beings should do in a, in a future which is not so far, where machines can do the physical work and can do the undecent jobs. Uh, so in, in the, the proposal, there is also an, uh, research, real research on the economic uh, model and public policies and also on the social models, because so far we have just accepted that technology changed our way of communication, of interaction with people without uh, anybody driving this change. But a public initiative like a flagship can do that. Uh, in fact, uh, the participants uh, in this proposal are very many. And uh, um, they are not just roboticists. If you look at the distribution among topics, so it's not easy to read, but uh, roboticists are about 60%. Then there is a good contribution from material science, from uh, neuroscience, medicine, life science, but also humanities. And uh, the way the, um, the proposal and the, the flagship would be organized is uh, not uh, on, on, the, on the participant, but uh, with the focus on the abilities. So the budget will be um, assigned to the abilities to reach that will be decided by the community itself, and then the community will organize to respond to, to, to the challenges given by such abilities in an interdisciplinary way. So that's why there is this uh, uh, very large community of participants from many disciplines. On the other hand, uh, the abilities will allow the application in what the, the societal challenges will be uh, from now in, in 10 years and more. So this is very modular, very scalable in time and uh, in budget and very inclusive because anybody is, is uh, invited to uh, participate. And um, uh, we will also try to put forward uh, more than one possible approaches to solve the same challenge so that we can scientifically have a better result by comparison of, of different uh, um, approaches. Uh, we have a good number of uh, letters of endorsement from uh, important institutions, ministries. Uh, of course, they are not all represented here because they are almost 400 and we have a very a uh, nice advisory board with different uh, uh, expertise involved from uh, economics to uh, robotics, of course, and neuroscience, uh, and, and also organization of projects. This is the team behind the preparation of the proposal. Almost, uh, no, more than half <laughs> is here. <laughs> and I mean, Jean-Paul, Stefan, no, uh, Dario. Uh, <coughs> And uh, there is a website uh, where you can find up-to-date information where you can uh, register to become a participant if you are not yet a participant. Uh, so my conclusions, very briefly, um, robotics and AI are uh, coming. Uh, there is a, a market uh, very soon for them. Um, and uh, we have seen there is a mutual benefit uh, um, from the convergence of robotics and AI. So we should really exploit the position of Europe in robotics to be competitive in robotics AI. Uh, and uh, um, an initiative like a flagship can really make the difference, can allow Europe to drive this uh, big change and to do that in a, in a responsible way, in a sustainable way from the environmental point of view, from the social point of view. 
Uh, we can respond to societal challenges uh, and we can maintain the competitiveness uh, of uh, European companies by creating jobs, in fact. Thank you.